Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Nesta. Um, I'm Jessica Bland. I work as a researcher in um, our policy and research team here, and it's a great pleasure to have many new faces in the building this evening. A couple of housekeeping things. Um, the the Wi-Fi password and details are up on the screen, screens, in fact, to my either side, um, including the hashtag next big thing if you want to join in the conversation on Twitter this evening. Unfortunately, we find that this hashtag has many other conversations on it, but we're sticking with it for this series of events we're holding. I'm sorry about that. I hope you all enjoyed a glass of wine um, and some snacks beforehand. We'll continue that afterwards um, as well for about half an hour if you want to stay around and continue the conversation longer than we manage in the next hour or so. Um, I'm very excited actually about the panel we have this evening to talk about, talk about the question of capturing the possibilities but avoiding the pitfalls of nanotechnology. Um, this is a subject that's been around a long time. The, the, the phrase nano or words nanotechnology has been the subject of public debate in the UK, perhaps we could say for 20 years. And this next big thing series is meant to be talking about the next big things in policy and maybe it seems a bit retrospective to use to have one on a term that's been around that long. Um, but there does seem to be a current at the moment where we're matching a lot of the hype and discussion there's been in the past with the realities of technology and science today. And I think Sonia will come on to some great examples of that later. Um, so this series of five events uh, started with one on geoengineering at um, held at Policy Exchange down the road, and we'll continue with some on cyber security and urban mobility um, on the 22nd of April and the 14th of May, if you're interested in other technology subjects. It's actually in partnership, these, this series, between the Oxford Martin School at the University of Oxford, which funds interdisciplinary research into the 21st century's global challenges. So they bring together over 300 Oxford academics um, and one of the conditions of their funding is that they must have impact beyond academia. So I'm very glad to have Eric and Sonia from that school here this evening um, taking part in this debate, which is hopefully a little bit beyond academia. We're also in partnership with Policy Exchange, which is one of the UK's leading think tanks. And they're committed to new policy ideas, which deliver better public services, a stronger society and a more dynamic economy. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad with the kind of about the the, the Whitehall connections that they bring for these kind of events. So instead of just talking about policy, hopefully we're actually starting to enact and change some of that as well. And finally, coming on to my own organisation, Nesta, we're now an independent charity focused on catalyzing innovation. And so that's in innovation in everything from public services <coughs> and the arts and humanities through to technology and science, which is obviously the focus of this evening. Um, I will close in a second and leave us to have five minute presentations from each of the people on the stage and then we'll go straight to question and answer for hopefully the last half an hour finishing about 7 30. but just take a second to introduce our panel um here is eric drexler who will speak first he was a pioneer of, of nanotechnology as i mentioned before he is now a visiting fellow um, at the oxford martin program on the impacts of future technology his landmark 1986 book engines of creation promised um, a new world of nanotechnology, mm. if that's fair to say. Mm. Um, and I'm very glad to hear that he's working on a new book as part of his work at the Oxford Martin School. We also have Richard Jones, who is an experimental physicist, and his 2004 book on soft machines um, talked a little bit about the lessons from cell biology we can learn at the nanoscale. He is also Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation at the University of Sheffield, which means he can talk to how this fits into the wider research system in the UK. We also have Sonia, who is a University Lecturer at Ox Oxford Physics Department and Co-Director of the Oxford Martin Programme on Na Nanotechnology. Um, she's held several research positions around the world. I was fascinated reading about her work from China to Japan to Denmark. And she, in 2003, she finally moved to Oxford at the University Bio Nanotechnology Interdisciplinary Research Centre. And finally, I come to John Knowles, who is currently chairman of the advisory board for the Nanotechnology Knowledge Transfer Network, um, run by the Technology Strategy Board in the UK. And he is also a director and shareholder in a number of technology companies, including Nanosite, which I think Nesta was an early investor they in. They were, <laughs> and we made them a profit. <laughs> a good story for Nesta then sitting yeah. to, to my right. 
Um, so to start off with, I think Eric has a presentation he's going to give us from the lectern. Yes. If you'd like to take the place. So the mic's a bit. This is a different slide. Let's see. There we go. So from the event brief, a number of topics were <coughs> suggested for what would be discussed. Uh, one is the atomically precise manufacturing, which is a subject that uh, uh, is the, the focus of my work and is related to deep and pervasive change and global challenges. So that's where I'm going to be ending up. But the initial part of, the, of this, this, this outline here will be addressing the question of the confusion associated with the meaning of nanotechnology and why there's been some frustration which is associated with that confusion. So this will be largely about contexting and best told as some history. So atomically pre precise manufacturing or APM uh, is a prospective technology rather clearly understood in its fundamentals but not a short distance from here. It's a number of technological development stages away. Uh, characterized by precise production atomic precision by guiding molecular motions, closely analogous to digital systems, uh, general purpose, high frequency devices able to make complex patterns, not pixels on a screen, but three-dimensional functional objects, and has some other advantages uh, noted below. So a bit of history, uh, I mentioned my 1986 book, Engines of Creation, which is marked on this, uh, this graph which is from uh, Google's Ngram search. This is the, the appearance of the word nanotechnology in books between 1984 and 2008. So you can see there was a steep ramp up, uh, more or less exponential ramp up across that time interval with a, a downturn at the end. Funding looks something like that. Uh, that those, those curves go up to the billion dollar range at the, at the 2006 mark. Part of what has been confusing is that there are two rather different, related but rather different definitions of nanotechnology. The initial definition was in terms of atomic precision, the result of guiding molecular motions to do fabrication, primarily coming out of the molecular sciences. The other one, uh, formalized in the United States uh, by the National Nanotechnology Institute, is in terms of physical size, saying that you have nanotechnology is if you have interesting, useful components that are on a scale of 100 nanometers or less. Very different from atomic precision, overlapping in range of, of applications, uh, but the distinctions should not be underestimated. But to tell the, the historical story, initial view of nanotechnology, this is actually what was leading up to the 1986 book. If you look at the molecular sciences and you ask where can technology go by taking atomic precision forward, chemists have been working with atomic precision for a century, you end up, first of all, looking at biology and the prospects for nanoscale macromolecular engineering, protein engineering, which was a topic I addressed uh, about five years before the book. Where does that lead? Well, you do a physics-based engineering analysis, and that leads to atomically precise manufacturing. It can be seen as an extension of some patterns we see in biology, intersected with patterns we see in conventional macroscale manufacturing, and again, with some close relationships to digital systems. It stands in between and builds on the principles in these three areas uh, with, uh, as, as revolutionary, atomically precise products that can't be made by other means. And it turns out that the physics also leads to very high productivity. Well, moving forward in time, something like this happened. Um, 2001. Essentially, now we're looking here at sort of the ideas in circulation in popular culture and among scientists who were, you know, in the laboratory doing the hard research work. The physics base and the, the bridge forward to atomically precise manufacturing really faded from attention. And the molecular sciences and nanoscale molecular engineering were not seen as relevant to the mainstream, the somewhat redefined mainstream of nanotechnology which came out of material science and produced nanomaterials, nanoparticles, nanoscale devices, and was thought to have some link because it shared the name nanotechnology to revolutionary atomically precise products, but without any clear picture of how one would get to there from that base. And in fact, uh, it was never, no one ever had a proposal for how to get there. So what drove, <laughs> This line of research forward is the 
frontier of applications in many areas, medicine, materials, and others, that are in many instances potentially revolutionary within an area of technology, but not a broad, fundamental, unified, revolutionary technology. Not like, for example, digital logic, which has enabled the information technology world. These are piecewise. Some of the applications are in information technology, but uh, quite different from APM. So what has happened since these, these early stepping stones that I showed earlier? Uh, we've had a better picture of intermediate stages of microscale uh, atomically precise systems engineering, and a better understanding of pathways forward, which will rely heavily on physics-based analysis, uh, simulation, and design. So these uh, represent a, a, the outline of a pathway forward, leading to similar range of applications, but at a higher level of quantity, lower level of cost, higher performance, related to the existing pathways in nanotechnology, the ones I showed a moment ago, and with many interactions cross applications. At the level of engineering applications, there are no clear distinctions in these pathways. It's a, an overlapping, joint, uh, uh, mutually supportive line of development. And yet there are very strong differences in the component technologies and products. Okay, so here are generic nanoparticles, uh, looking a lot like gravel, but here seen in an electron micrograph. And for contrast, here are some atomically precise structures made today with structural DNA nanotechnology intricate structures with atomically precise defined structures. Very different. Incremental paths lead to more atomically precise structures. These are pictures of machines, machine systems. Abstractly, at the end of a line of development, atomically precise manufacturing is about a convergent process, uh, shown in a little more detail here, where simple chemical substances come in, Molecules are atomically precise, put together by nanoscale machinery to make larger parts, larger parts, and ultimately macroscale products. Uh, low cost follows from the cost of the inputs, the high productivity that falls out of the physics. So manufacturing, and APM in particular, uh, advances in these areas are what are leading to and can lead to much further advances in low cost solar electric power, the manufacturing problem. Zero net carbon emission systems and an economy, ultimately. It's, again, about making the kinds of devices that we already know will work, and, of course, developing better ones. Sustainable global development is also a manufacturing problem, and advanced manufacturing supports a very wide range of advanced technologies. The advance of science and technology ultimately rests on our ability to make things. Atomically precise manufacturing promises something like the digital revolution in information but in the world of material objects. So that is the outline of the concept and how it is embedded in and has been related to nanotechnology in a broader sense. Uh, in light of the recent uh, geoengineering uh, uh, session here, I would like to point to the trillion ton greenhouse gas problem, the scenarios that the IPCC has had for increase in CO2 concentration versus time between 2000 and 2100, all of them go up. We're looking at increasing change. I think that people who are close to this problem don't see any way out long term that doesn't involve somehow removing CO2 from the atmosphere. But that's a trillion tons, order of a trillion tons of dilute gas. That takes energy. The problem of getting adequate energy is a manufacturing problem. It turns out that one can walk through a system analysis that says that if you have an APM level technology base, you can do something like this, where instead of the curves going up due to continued carbon emissions, you zero out carbon emissions, take them deeply negative, and actually return the atmosphere to its previous composition. That takes about 10 to the 21 joules of energy. That's three terawatts for a decade. And three terawatts is approximately the same as the current global US human electric power generating uh, capacity for the world as a whole. Not an accessible project with our existing manufacturing cost structure becomes accessible with a very different class of system. And just to wrap that up, the key points are, first, nanotechnology has diverse meanings. If you want to talk about nanotechnology, you have to first ask, what are we talking about? Medicine, materials, APM? 
these technologies are complementary but distinct. To get to APM calls for focused atomically precise systems development. That focus remains to be implemented in research policy. And finally, the prospect is a broad and profound revolution. And I'm somewhat over my time. I had been told seven minutes somewhere. And I'm over that as well. My apologies. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Eric. Um,